Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Fossil Friday Chats. I'm Brittany Stoneberg uh, from the Western Science Center. With me, as always, is Gabe Santos from the ALF Museum. Hi, everybody. And today we are joined by two speakers, uh, Alexis Mikhailo and Ryan Muhammad. Alexis, Ryan, how are you guys doing today? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. Happy it's summer. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Welcome to the show. I'm really, really excited to learn about uh, the time capsules you're going to be talking about later today. Yeah, also very excited for summer. Not excited for the heat outside here in Southern California, but that's okay. We'll, we will survive. <laughs> um, so if you guys are not familiar with our speakers today, uh, let me tell you a little bit about them. Uh, Dr. Alexis Mikhailo is a conservation biologist and paleoecologist who studies extinction, past, present, and future. She works in the Caribbean, California, and the Northeastern US, and really loves small mammals. We definitely um, are of the same mind about that. Dr. Ryan Muhammad is an ecologist with a wide range of interests and expertise spanning guppies to glyptodonts. He currently works on a variety of projects advising students who study the biodiversity of Trinidad and Tobago and how it relates to conservation, tourism, and sustainable development. Uh, I personally am not familiar at all with the fossil record from this area, so I am super excited to hear you guys talk more about it today. I feel like it's a very overlooked, um, an overlooked place for paleontology. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Alexis. I was going to say, yeah, I, I think the Caribbean is a wonderful place to work, but definitely needs some more love uh, from paleontologists for sure. It's an excellent bridge between the, the rest of the Antilles and South America, showing that distinct um, variety of uh, the fauna that existed during the Ice Age. And it's reflected in the fauna we have in, in the Caribbean and South America now. And I would like to add, most importantly, that the food is excellent. <laughs> We're going we're gonna to get everybody craving craving it for lunch, I feel like, by the time this episode is over. <laughs> I'm okay so, with that. Uh -huh. <laughs> so if anybody has any questions for our speakers, as always, we're going to have a Q&A portion uh, after their lecture. So if you have questions, go ahead and put those in the chat, and we'll get to as many as possible um, after they speak. So whenever you guys are ready, go on ahead. All right. Can you guys see my screen okay? Yep.
presentation. And today, both Ryan and I will share with you some things like, what is a tar pit? Why are they so amazing? Why are we so particularly excited that they're on Trinidad? What are we learning? And how can we protect these places, right? They're not just places where we go to take things out of, but they are the operation and can be used for many things from education to community building and cultural activities. And we'll also really emphasize why it's important when we're doing our research that the fossils stay in Trinidad today. And for folks who might be doing their own research or traveling and looking for fossils, why you should definitely consider when you're doing your work, where your specimens end up and who they belong to. So many of you may have heard of tar pits before. I think they're fairly famous in many ways. Here's of course, SpongeBob getting stuck in Bikini Bottom and the Simpsons even visited some tar pits too. And that's probably because the La Brea tar pits in Los Angeles is just so incredibly famous, right? It's like right next to Hollywood major tourist destination and it's because it's so cool and it's right in the middle of the city you can see paleontologists every day out there digging up new finds and it's an ongoing site right so it's yielding millions of specimens of what ice age los angeles used to look like and what's so special about this is not just that it's in a city but that these fossils are actually preserved in asphalt an asphalt that is naturally occurring so I'll use the La Brea tar pits in Los Angeles just to introduce you to what a tar pit is and how they happen. So note that I'll say tar pit, uh, but these are also technically, scientifically asphalt seeps. Um, and so in some places there's oil underground. And when you have the right conditions, that oil is able to migrate upwards. And as it's migrating upwards, a lot of the gases evaporate, leaving you with this very sticky asphalt that can be at the surface where things like plants and animals can get stuck or where it can cover existing material that's already there. And so this natural asphalt can preserve the remains of past life and over time create these wonderful time capsules for us to find that are these uh, conglomerations of sticky dirt chock full of all these lovely fossils. And a fun fact that I'm frequently asked is, uh, whether the asphalt bubbles are hot, right? Is it because it's steam coming off? But no, it's just a bunch of stinky gases that are coming out. So it's not hot. And asphalt actually occurs naturally in some places thanks to geologic luck. So you might be thinking of asphalt like in a parking lot. That is not what I am talking about. That's trucked in. But in fact, you can see in this picture here, this is actually naturally occurring. So if you go in the mountains of Ojai, California, you might think that this is an overgrown parking lot, but it's actually naturally occurring asphalt that's come up to the surface with plants that are um, kind of growing around it. So this does occur naturally. Um, it is just, again, due to geologic luck. So in a place like Southern California, we have it thanks to what's known as the Monterey Formation and San Pedro Formation. Um, down here in Southern California, you can actually walk the beach and see an outcrop of this. This is over in Goleta, California. You can see these um, the different layers here. And again, just thanks to geologic luck, having this hydrocarbon history combined with faulting systems means that this asphalt is able to come up and entrap um, plants and animals for us. And why are these so special? Quite honestly, it's because they are just incredible time capsules of what ecosystems look like and how they change over time. So in a lot of paleontological sites, you might get just a bone, just some insects, just some plants, but in places like asphaltic deposits, you actually get everything all together. So this is one beautiful picture from the tar pits in Los Angeles. You can see just how incredibly spoiled we are. Everything's like just incredibly dense and rich, full of bones. But even within these sediments here, we find the remains of plants and snails, insects and tiny mammals, tiny lizards. So we can actually look at the whole ecosystem. And what's also really important about these sites is that they preserve bones and other material in places where preservation would normally just not happen. And that's because the asphalt can actually get into the tissues and protect it from water. And so in places that are 
humid and hot places like California or in the Caribbean, we're able to still have a fossil record thanks to the asphalt. And one thing that's really, uh, I think, sticks in people's mind about tar pits is this idea of looking at all the megafauna and in particular looking at the carnivores. So from an ecologist perspective or paleontologist perspective even, we would expect carnivores to be very rare, right? Only one for every few uh, mega herbivores, let's say. But if you've ever been to the tar pits in Los Angeles, you know that that is not the case, right? Tar pits are these incredible places for carnivores, right? Where you have things like this dire wolf wall with 400 skulls. So in the La Brea tar pits of Los Angeles, there's more carnivores than herbivores. And so one thing we think of is that perhaps it's because the carnivores were getting attracted to struggling herbivores and getting stuck. And so this has kind of been this definition of what a tar pit is, but, right, and it's due to the taphonomy or fossilization process. But one thing that I've been curious about as someone who works in many places around the world is, is it all tar pits that have this carnivore bias that are formed in this particular way? Or is it just the one that we all think of in Los Angeles because it's famous? And what does this mean for what research we can do? So to look at this and to really understand the diversity of tar pits, I've tried to travel to as many as possible. I haven't been to all of them, but I've been to quite a few of them. And so I really wanna share with you what I've been learning from my work in Trinidad and what it adds to the story of tar pits uh, more globally. So for those who are unfamiliar, Trinidad is an island in the Caribbean. It's kind of this bridge between South America here and the rest of the Caribbean. So it's really interesting from many different scientific perspectives because it has qualities of both an island, but also this mainland South America. And in particular, when I arrived there, I was shocked by the diversity of animals, all feeling like you're still in a South American ecosystem, because for my graduate work, I actually worked in uh, the Dominican Republic in Haiti, which has very, very different mammals from South America because of its island history. So I was really shocked by just how many plants and animals were there on Trinidad that made you feel like you were still on South America. So I knew something was up already just from trying to look at this incredible diversity. And when we step back in time and try to make sense of this, as a paleontologist, I recognized, well, probably this was due to sea level. Trinidad was once part of South America. So if we look here, this is where sea level um, changed over time from the Pleistocene to present. So all of this dotted line would have been above uh, water in the past. So it would have been a lot more land area. And immediately what I was thinking is, okay, this is probably why we have the diversity there today, but what else was there? How did this all unfold? Were there megafauna there? When did things go extinct? Was it all part of one big grassland? We just had no answers to these questions. And as I mentioned, because asphaltic deposits are really great for protecting things from water and heat, Trinidad's asphaltic deposits were really, really lucky for us because in the Caribbean, it's really hard to find fossils that are still around um, just because of the preservation conditions. And so again, thanks to geologic luck, there is an incredible amount of oil in Trinidad. So you can see here all of these oil fields. Um, and so we knew that Southern Trinidad was probably a great place to go looking for something like a tar pit or asphaltic deposit especially because it even has things like Pitch Lake, which is a proposed UNESCO World Heritage Site. So our first stop was looking at Pitch Lake, and it actually has an estimated 10 million tons of asphalt with this incredible wetland on top, which Ryan is far more uh, well-versed in than I am. But you can actually find fish living in the water above the asphalt. And it's similarly been mined for many uh, decades, going to make roads in many different places around the world. And so while this site actually turns out to be really important archaeologically uh, for Trinidad, we don't think there are any Ice Age or Pleistocene mammal fossils there. But we found some other clues in old documents, particularly related to old oil exploration, that could help us try and rediscover some early clues and finds. So we had this old document from an oil company that showed this glyptodon carapace emerging from the ground from one of their sites, 
which we were able to relocate here, the same oil well. We also found some old documents uh, from other oil companies describing these teeth from a proboscidean or elephant relative. And so we patched together all of these old documents with some oil company records to try and relocate some sites. And then we also talked to local people and asked them if they knew anything. So for example, this one site here, we know of because people's hunting dogs were getting stuck in the asphalt. At our work, we have access to some incredible fossils that have really changed what we think about Trinidad as an island and what it looked like and what lived there. So for example, there are some materials that tell us that there were things like paleo llama and gomphotheres, things that are obviously not there today and we had no clue were there in the past as a very small island. There's also a very wide diversity of sloths. Um, some of these incredible finds like this beautiful tooth and jaw here. We had three families of sloths in Trinidad and also a lot of material indicating glyptodonts and pampatheres. So all of these South American megafauna that we don't find on other Caribbean islands, we do find in Trinidad's fossil record. And my favorite <laughs> fossil, which as you heard, I love small mammals, is of this articulated rodent that was preserved on a block of matrix. So you can see his little teeth sticking out over here. He's kind of laying down on his side. And what we ended up doing was putting this block in a micro CT scanner, the whole block. We didn't try to take anything out. And when we did that, I kind of felt like an expectant mother looking in at the scan. We found not one, but two sets of, uh, you know, skulls indicating that there was actually a hidden second rodent in that block. And this is really helpful um, when we were working with our lab preparator, trying to think about how do we tackle these different types of asphaltic fossils. But with these scans, we were able to look at the teeth and identify it as this rodent here, the short-tailed cane mouse, which is still alive and very common in grasslands. And so these rodents, even though it's a small fossil, could actually help us understand something much bigger, which is this connection to Venezuelan grasslands. So already the presence of megafauna, this, the lower sea level indicates that Trinidad was part of this larger ecosystem that with sea level rise at the end of the Pleistocene, uh, may have isolated it into an island and led to extinction. So not only does this little rodent help give us the context of a grassland for the bigger mammals we found, but also it gives us different insight into why it's important to protect some of the remaining natural grasslands on Trinidad today. And so I'll just end by sharing with you, trying to contextualize Trinidad in the larger world of tar pits. So from these pie charts here, I'm just showing you basically the different abundances of mega carnivores versus herbivores. So in California, you know, there's a lot of green. That's all those carnivores, right? That carnivore bias that we all think of when we think of tar pits, or at least the paleontologists uh, on the call certainly would. But what's important to note is that not all tar pits are like that. In fact, a lot of them have a lot of yellow in some places, which we can see here in this Trinidad circle, a lot of these mega herbivores, like the giant ground sloth. And what this is telling us is that not all tar pits are the same. And in fact, the tar pits that we're working with in Trinidad probably formed in very different ways. And that means that we have to use those fossils in different ways doing our research. We can't ask the same questions. The preservation is very different. The biases we're dealing with are very different. And so right now we're actively working to try and reconstruct even how the site formed to help us better understand the ecology of the system. So one thought is that perhaps it was a super lucky swamp where um, I guess not very lucky for the things that died there, but they were on their way to becoming fossils when secondarily asphalt came up at the right time and preserved things that were already dead and in the process of degrading. So these are just some of the questions that we can start asking once we actually go to these places and really get a feel for the many different types of sites you have and not, not just looking at sites from one particular lens. So this leads me to say that breas or tar pits are like a box of chocolates, but all of them have different colors and preservation histories that Bones from one site are very different from bones from another, and you really need to think about local context to interpret them correctly. And part of that local context means learning from local people. And so 
I'm going to turn it over now to Dr. Ryan Muhammad to learn more about how exactly we're trying to build a community of paleontologists in Trinidad and Tobago and harness the ecological knowledge they already have and are experts on because it's their backyards and local environment. And I just want to note that it's been really hard for us to see the full picture of those past ecosystems because many specimens left the country during the colonial period. And so we've been working really hard to try and bring back some of these specimens or reunite them, or at least find them and bring them into a single scientific paper if we can't bring them into a single museum space. Um, and with that, I think I will turn it over to Dr. Muhammad and stop sharing. Alexis um, left off. Uh, first, I'll give you some context how I actually started to be involved in uh, involved with fossil work in Trinidad and Tobago. And the to take a bit out of Tolkien speed. And in Trinidad and Tobago. But then I also look, worked in some extreme habitats such as the Pitch Lake and the Sulphur Springs and the mud volcanoes in Trinidad. And as Alexis pointed out, the Pitch Lake is indeed a unique habitat. It's a large, sulf, a large asphalt deposit, kind of looks like a large overgrown car park with a few puddles and grasses in between. The mud volcanoes, on the other hand, it, again, another unique habitat where you see both asphaltic uh, residue coming up, but the water you see has a strong saline component. And one moment, again, one moment, Ryan, sorry. Uh, Gabe, did you see that there's, uh, that he might be muted? Okay. Apologies, everyone. Uh, Okay, we, we okay there? Yep, go right ahead. All right. So in this PhD work, I, I, I eventually ended up looking at investigations of host dynamics with parasites at elevated temperatures. And these elevated temperatures were from our extreme habitats that the fish were found in. 
But I still had a, a, a love and an interest in working in mud volcanoes, and especially because these mud volcanoes offered a unique aquatic habitat. Some of these habitats, they've been incorporated into the culture in Trinidad, where we see one mud volcano in the southwest part of Trinidad uh, having a strong, in, a strong influence in the Hindu culture, where they've actually built a temple around the mud volcano. And then I found fish in some of these mud volcanoes, and not just, or not all the time it would be dead fish, but these fish were living in these conditions. Some of the mud volcanoes, they had typical conical shapes. Some of them looked almost like a barren wasteland, uh, almost like a desert. And some scarred their way through the forests in, south, in southern parts of Trinidad, producing these large landslides leading straight to the coastlines and, and cutting their way straight through the substrate. But then in 2018, uh, we hosted a biodiversity conference in Trinidad. And that was where my life changed. I met these two young ladies, Dr. Alexis Mikhailo and Ashling Farrell. Alexis was doing a fellowship at the La Brea Pit Museum and Ashling uh, was the collections manager at the time. And that was where this introduced me to these fossils, these large uh, organisms that was found in Trinidad. And I had no idea these creatures existed in Trinidad because I was so focused on everything that was alive at the time. I didn't consider what used to be here. And they were telling me about these giants that roamed during the Ice Age, such as the Glossotheriums, Eritreums, etc. And I was surprised to know that all of these fossils that they were telling me about no longer resided in Trinidad. And I was even more surprised to find out these fossils were being found in areas very similar to what, where I had an original interest in these mud volcanoes, as well as the tar pits. So it was no surprise that the areas where the fossils were being found also were the same areas I had an interest in, uh, in to, with regards to the habitats. And we see that a lot of the fossils have been, ex uh, have been extracted from Trinidad uh, in the early 1920s. And this was all linked to oil exploration in the 1920s, which is when Trinidad actually started our, our quest for oil and, ha and having an uh, economy based on the oil sector. As Alexis pointed out, a lot of these uh, organisms, they resided in some of the grasslands that, uh, that are very similar to the grasslands in South America. And in Trinidad, we still have some areas of these grassland type savannas, in, uh, for instance, in the Repo Savannah, where you, would, and where you would find unique habitats again, but at the same time, we are at risk of losing these types of habitats. And this is reminiscent of the type of fauna and flora you would have had during the Ice Age in the southern part of Trinidad, when Trinidad was still connected to the South American mainland. Another unique one, and, and as Alexis pointed out, her favorite fossil was the, the rodents, the mammals uh, in that block. I think my favorite fossil would be either the glyptotheriums or the glyptodons. Now, we, 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 Alexa showed this photo of this large glyptodon being ex, uh, extracted during that, uh, that oil exploration. And uh, we believe this would have been somewhere in the 1950s. This actual specimen now resides in Milwaukee Public Museum. It's one of the fossils that I would really like to see return to Trinidad eventually. But why the main reason I really like uh, the glyptodons and the glyptotheriums, et cetera, because the glyptodon fossils have been found in Crusoe Cave in Southwest Tobago. This is probably the one taxa that we see a direct link between Trinidad and Tobago, showing that land bridge between Trinidad and Tobago. 
But then the fossils returned to Trinidad following the discussions with Alexis and Ashling and, and their incredible work trying to source these fossils from a range of museums spread across the US. So the fossils, they came back to Trinidad, Alexis and Ashling, they brought them back and they were ceremoniously handed over to the University of the West in the Zoology Museum upon their return. And we see that we have in excess of probably 20 species, 20 different types of organisms easily from, these, from one of these sites. And it could easily be more than that. We still have to evaluate the biodiversity uh, of, these, of these fossils. Only two thirds of the fossils have been returned to Trinidad thus far. And we still have, we possibly even have some new species to document once we start to investigate further. When Alexis and Ashton came here, they hosted a series of workshops as well as some field trips where we visited the Pitch Lake. The Pitch Lake, again, it, it's an interesting habitat where on one side it's grass covering pitch, but on the next side you have this unique fauna and flora, especially considering there's actually three species of fish that live in the Pitch Lake. There's a lot of research published on the bacterial composition in the pitch lake, but we are also seeing that this unique flora and fauna actually contributes to a unique a food web, unique nitrogen and, and um, carbon uh, sequestration processes happening in the pitch lake. So we've come into a few challenges, especially when it came to bringing the fossils back to Trinidad, because although the fossils left Trinidad, with permission in the 1920s and 1980s, both as part of the colonial period during when we had the oil exploration, but a lot of it left Trinidad um, for science, for academic research. However, because of the, our very lax legislation, there was no distinct plan to get the fossils back to Trinidad. Even in the process of bringing them back to Trinidad, now we realize there was no legislation that protected these items. Um, whether it came from the Minerals Act, uh, where there was a discussion, well, these might be considered minerals now because of their rock-like nature, or from the Conservation of Wildlife Act, considering these were animal nature, or from the Public Health Act, considering, again, this might have been considered tissue at some point in time. And these were real discussions we had trying to get permission back trying to get permission to return these these fossils to Trinidad. And it was eventually Conservation and Wildlife Act that, that afforded us permission to bring these fossils back. But then we found there's a National Trust Act where the, 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 it is the only place where the word fossil is mentioned in any of the Trinidad and Tobago laws, where we see that the proper, uh, property of interest means that any monument, any fossil, Place, uh, place or site of natural beauty and national historic scientific or archeological interest. And this is the only legislation that actually affords the fossils some type of protection. So what's the next step in this journey? Well, first thing, we really need to complete the accession and process of the fossils at the UWI, at the UWI Zoological Museum. As I said before, some of the fossils still have to be returned, but due to restrictions and COVID, which is another challenge, uh, we haven't uh, had the opportunity to actually bring the fossils back. We need to document and publish the biodiversity of these fossils and, and the organisms that existed during this ice age period in Trinidad. We have to have our fossils listed as national heritage items of Trinidad and Tobago because we now see the importance of these fossils uh, being listed as national treasures. Additionally, we need to protect the unique habitats as well as the, the sites that uh, have yielded these fossils in the past. And lastly, we need to resume the dig. We have planned training workshops with the National Trust of Trinidad and Tobago, uh, uh, as well as excavations and documentations of these findings soon. So as soon as we 
I, I have that opportunity to get back out into the field. I think Alexis and her team would be back in Trinidad enjoying curry soon. So to bring this to a close, I'd like to acknowledge the curator of the Libria Tapet Museum, especially Alexis and Ashling Ascanio Rincon and Greg McDowell. They were instrumental in identifying these fossils. Adi Shramsubag and Professor Jairam Jairaj, who were also instrumental in, in inviting Alexis and Ashling back to Trinidad and the logistics that afforded that as well as the research students, Lauren, Seren, and Richard, that participated in various projects using these fossils and these habitats. Okay. And now I'd like to open the floor for, for questions and discussions, and I hand it back to Gabriel and Brittany. Thank you so much, Alexis and Brian. Uh, that was informative on a number of levels. Help. Yeah, that was that was a real great story. I mean, it it's so interesting because it's one of those things where a lot of folks think about paleontology as just being this really like small thing where people go out and just look at dinosaur bones. But the story you both got to tell today was fantastic because it brings in conservation, talks about fossil collecting and ethics and, mm -hmm. you know, education and even, you know, fossil repatriation. And it, those mm -hmm. are the kind of things that I think it's important that people know, like paleontology isn't just looking at, at dinosaurs. There's a lot that goes into <laughs> it. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, we, we're, we're really grateful to have this opportunity to, to start to make those types of links. And I know from a biodiversity perspective, it means so much more knowing about the past rather than just what we have currently in Trinidad and Tobago. And, and mentioning Tobago, even to draw that link between Trinidad and Tobago. Tobago has largely an Antillian type um, flora and fauna having that greater connectivity to the other islands. And Trinidad has that connectivity to South America, but we are one country. So having in the fossil records, that link between Trinidad and Tobago is very important for, on a national scale, especially. Oh, Ryan, really quick, uh, your camera seems to be off right now. <laughs> All right. No worries. Yeah, back. There we go. There we go. <laughs> Well, I like yeah. this. I, really, uh, <laughs> I liked how you mentioned that people think of paleontology as people going out and just looking at dinosaurs because growing up and even when I was an undergrad, that's what I thought it was. And so my background is actually not in paleontology because I didn't realize until much later in my training that that's actually what paleontology could be. It could be more than just studying bones. Um, it's about context. And also when you go to the place to excavate, who you talk to and the local ecosystem. Um, so it definitely was an evolution for me, for sure, to become a paleontologist in the first place. I, yeah. I think one of the more interesting aspects of the story is when you talk about bringing the fossils back to Trinidad and Tobago that were removed, I mean, for academic research. But, you know, I do some work with um, Dr. Blorsa Zygmindjian at the Institute for Study of Mongolian Dinosaurs, helping to repatriate fossils back to Mongolia so the people of Mongolia can appreciate and learn about the fossils that were found in their own backyard. And I think it's so important that, you know, we do more to ensure that, uh, you know, people can learn about fossils in their home, in their home and not have to travel internationally. Um, for, for, for both of you, especially for Ryan, how do you think we can advocate more so that, you know, paleontologists or scientists can understand the importance of ensuring that we work closely with, you know, folks in their home country and not removing specimens and making sure that we help to not only like work with them, but train and uplift other, you know, people from other countries that we work in. I think the first thing, um, it, it, ha it has to come from, the, the foreign researchers, they, they need to initiate this process. They need to appreciate that if you want to come to a country to do research, you need to engage the local uh, scientific community. And if that, that isn't present, at least 
the local governmental institution that might have jurisdiction on these things and help build the capacity from that perspective. And once that bridge is built and that link is made, um, you have a, 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 a natural pool of resources there. Once you start to build that capacity in the country, you have, you have young researchers that will be willing to participate, willing to learn. You have strengthening of legislation that will happen. And eventually, uh, I think the last thing that you have to look at is in terms of publishing your results, a lot of the new journal, a lot of the journals now they want to see this ethic approval. They want to see that local contribution from from the country's origin of specimens, not just fossils, but overall biological materials. Definitely engaging ministries, engaging um, the local academic fraternity would help in this process. Yeah, and I have kind of two things to add to that. First is that um, grant agencies can do a lot by requiring that, you know, when you put in a grant, you have a component like that. I think sometimes for like an NSF broader impacts, sometimes people save that for last, but that should really be the first thing you write when you're designing your research. And I know some organizations will no longer fund field research unless you have a local collaborator. So. I think National Geographic does a great job, for example, because they require that as part of your application. So at the end of the day, you won't get the money if you don't do the right thing. Um, but I also think when we're training our students, you know, people who work with animals have to take ethical training. Anthropologists take ethical training. There's no ethics required for paleontology uh, degrees, right? Like when we send students out into the fields, we, we train them, you know, for safety, but we don't think about training them for how are you going to talk to people? Who are you going to work with? How do you navigate local power dynamics? Like, that's not part of our training typically. So I think we can really push um, to think about how we train, um, you know, future generations of paleontologists and we can start doing it ourselves. Yes, yeah, definitely. I absolutely agree. Yeah, there's definitely some ethics involved uh, in all of this. At the UWI Zoology Museum, um, we have the remains of, of the Banwari man, which is supposed to be one of the oldest specimens uh, of human um, uh, civilization in the Caribbean. And, and the, the, the item resides at the UWI Zoology Museum. However, at the risk of calling it an item, at the end of the day, even though it's 5,000 years old, these are still remains of indigenous peoples. And there are several researchers that come to the museum and they look at it as a specimen, as, as an item. But at the end of the day, this is, this is someone's culture we have to consider. And it, it, in, by and large, it's the same way with, with all other specimens. This is not just an item with an accession number. Um, it, they have to be viewed with some level of respect, some level of dignity, because at the end of the, of the day, if it is that we don't know what we have and foreigners come to Trinidad and Tobago and tell us what we have, it, it means that they also have that power over Trinidad and Tobago to, tell, to keep from us what we don't know. And so definitely once we have that type of engagement, it will show that, you know, one, it's a testimony of good faith, but two, it definitely builds capacity within the countries. Yeah, absolutely. I think that those are really, really important points that you made, Ryan, especially you said it's, you know, for some of these things, it's, it's not an item. It's not, we have to really ensure that there's respect or mutual respect, even when we're, when we're working with folks and working with the specimens. So thank you for that. All right, we have some great questions in the chat, so I'm going to get to as many as we can. Um, let's see, uh, this question is from Tesma. Is there any stratification or layering within a tar pit? Or are the animals and plants from a wide range of time jumped together in a mix, in like a tar pit soup? <laughs> ah, one of my favorite questions. Um, so yes, it totally depends. 
So um, typically when we think of tar pits, we do think of things as jumbled. And that's because we think of something like the La Brea tar pits in Los Angeles, where things were getting stuck and getting moved around. Um, and so there, as far as we know from the bones, there is no stratigraphy. That's kind of been the story we've told for almost 100 years now. But when we start to take a look at some of these other sites, so as I mentioned in Trinidad, we don't actually have any carnivore fossils. Um, we don't have that same bias. We think there's different types of preservation going on. And so in a site like the ones we have in Trinidad, there's a lot greater chance that we will have stratigraphy. However, the bones that we've been working with were actually things that were removed without the context being noted. Um, so that's why we have to go back to the site. We have funding to do that. We're just waiting for things to open up um, and to actually reevaluate the site and look for that stratigraphy because we have that clue of a lack of carnivore stratigraphy. So we think the site is different than what we have in Los Angeles. Although I think our geologist at the tar pits in Los Angeles will be angry with me if I don't note that we don't know the whole geological side of things in Los Angeles. <laughs> and we do have um, stratified middens there. So uh, we just keep learning more and more. And I think that's why it's important to always have the context, which is something that we're working to do now. <laughs> awesome. All right. Let's see. Another good question. Uh, it seems like all or most of these tar pits are from the Pleistocene. Uh, do we know why? Would there have been uh, tar pits 100 million years ago as well, and they just eroded away? Well, this is a fun question. Um, so in Venezuela, we think there are some that actually have Pliocene age material, for, uh, for example. But what I will say is that for a tar pit, you have to have the hydrocarbons or oil or asphalt that's older than the fossils themselves. So the age of these sites really depends on kind of that oil and hydrocarbons and when it's able to do its magic effectively. Um, I will say that there is one that is a lot older, millions of years older from Oklahoma, which I just put that star in the map for the first time for this presentation uh, that we went and evaluated last winter. Um, so we have a blog about it on the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County website. And that one's probably like several hundred million, potentially even Permian. So stay tuned. Wow. <laughs> it's all not traditionally tar pity, but there's some type of hydrocarbon impregnation. Mm -hmm. Ooh. That's all cool. right. Yeah. Uh, this is a good question. Also from Tesma. Uh, that I think will be fun to answer. How difficult is it to excavate fossils from a tar pit? So I would say <laughs> this is the best person to ask for that for sure. Best people are the excavators of the tar pits in Los Angeles. They do all the, the hard work. I would say that I've had compared to them, not that much experience, but I will say that it's more like sticky dirt. You're not like putting on waders and waiting for the <laughs> asphalt. Um, <laughs> For the most part, it's a lot of sticky dirt, but I will let Ryan maybe talk about what it's like to work in Pitch Lake because Pitch Lake is a very special situation. <laughs> yeah, so so unlike the La Brea Tapit sites that Alexis described as sticky dirt, um, I, I do recall when I was at La Brea Tapit Museum, um, I was told that the material that's preserved in the fossils in La Brea Tapit versus the pitch lake or uh, and the sites that we have in Trinidad is completely different, a different constituent uh, uh, altogether. Having said that, we haven't actually dug into the, these new sites as yet, so we have no idea what it might be like once we start to go into there. Um, but at the pitch lake, pitch lake is unique. It's digging through rock hard pitch in some places, and then in other places, it's it's, it's molten, liquid, thick, viscous oil um, that, you know, just assume that you're going to ruin your, your trainers <laughs> and, and, and You know, get get the cheapest spare possible and, and have, 
easily available, some sort of solvent to remove pitch from everything. Um, it's not an easy sight. Even when you think you're going into the water, below the water, there's liquid pitch. This thick, viscous chewing gum, almost consistency in some points, but it's, it gets into everything. Fish seem to love it. <laughs> <laughs> that's so cool i was gonna ask like the it doesn't affect the water quality at all right for the it fish does. it does and this is what makes the pitch lake such a strange place it's a series of punctuated pools that seem to be connected once rain falls and then because we we have extremes in weather sometimes we had 10 minutes ago we had rain and it was a proper thunderstorm and now we have bright sunlight here so the water in the pitch lake dries up very fast, but at the same time, it could be completely submerged very fast. And you have this mixing of waters, but then you have some pools that definitely have higher concentrations of sulfur. Some have higher concentrations of methane. And the fish, they move through these underground tunnels that links pools to each other. And we didn't know this before. Uh, because, you know, trying to catch guppies in these pools, the guppies would just disappear and you'd wonder why, and then you see them appear in another pool. And we only realize that because these, these, the pitch forms folds, and the folds, when, when they meet each other, there's these gaps in between, and the fish just disappear. They use this like almost like a London tube connecting pools to each other. And they seem to have biases, which pools they like to exist in, um, some pools have a lot of algae. Some pools have no algae at all. Some pools, the water temperature gets to above 50 degrees Celsius from when I was doing my research. Uh, some of them, they maintain a warm temperature during the day and the night. It, it, there's very little predictability in the pitch lake in terms of the habitat, but yet it's such a constant habitat because the fish always exist. And it's probably one of the most I can't re-emphasize how much. It's the most unique wetland, I would say, uh, in Trinidad and Tobago, because it's not viewed as a wetland. It's viewed as a hydrocarbon mine and deposit. Huh. Well, I know what I'm going to be reading more about during my lunch break. That is so cool. <laughs> That's so cool. Oh, man. That sounds so unique. Um, all right. Looks like we've got time for one more question, and this is a great one from um, our friend Bailey. Awesome presentation. Can you talk more about getting these fossils listed as national treasures? Is it a difficult process to get them legally recognized this way? No, it's it, it, so um, be, because of uh, my new interest in these fossils, I actually became a member of the National Trust of Trinidad and Tobago, and now I am part of the Landmarks Committee that has been given the task of listing items in Trinidad and Tobago. With, uh, and my particular interest is natural heritage sites. Um, so now that I'm more involved in heritage, it, it gives me that opportunity to, I wouldn't say fast track the process, but at least understand the process a little bit more. Uh, so when new sites exist, when new items exist like of this nature, we, we now have a template how to draft a dossier to have these processes listed, how to go about the public consultations to have the items listed, which ministries we need to engage, um, which uh, the, the fossils, they are now officially owned by the University of the West Indies, but at the same time, they are national heritage items for all of Trinidad and Tobago to enjoy. How do we enjoy that th these items have that public access? So it's not a difficult process now. It is one that has a fair amount of bureaucracy, but now that I'm more involved with the National Trust, definitely um, it makes it a little bit easier. And definitely now it means we have a partner directly to engage. Before, uh, when Alexis and Ashling started, um, they were looking for, for a local collaborator. Now we have that opportunity of having not just the National Trust, but Trinidad and Tobago Field Naturalist Club. They were instrumental in the last workshops we had. We have the Geological Society wanting to come on board. We have the University of West Indies that is still um, the, 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 the repository of the fossils. 
So I think definitely we have a way forward with regards to having them listed now. Great to hear. Well, I think like that was our last question. So thank you so much to everybody who asked us questions today. Um, they were really, really great. And thank you so much to Alexis and Ryan for sharing yeah. such a wonderful and like inspirational story. And again, like it's so different from what people may consider what paleontology is. Um, we usually end the show with uh, asking our guests to maybe give one piece of advice for future scientists. So Alexis and Ryan, if you can think of uh, just one really quick piece of advice you'd like to share for, for future scientists out there watching. Ladies first. <laughs> um, I think the best thing you can do as a scientist is to be humble and kind and to always recognize that you don't know everything that you're learning, so be kind to yourself. But also, uh, in being humble, it means that there are a lot of opportunities to work with other people and learn from other people. And I think that's where great collaboration starts. Yeah, I like that. Um, to add to that, definitely follow your passion, but at the same time, don't be close-minded to your passions. I, I started as an aquatic biologist, and I haven't seen a fossilized fish as yet. <laughs> but it, but it's not going to limit my my work my involvement in fossil research, and promoting the knowledge of fossils to Trinidad and Tobago. So definitely keep your mind open, but fossil, follow your passions as well. Awesome. Thank you both so much for that. Um, Thank you. We're going to have links. We're going to have links on everyone's social media and websites in the description below. So make sure you check that out, um, especially support the work that the very important work that both Alexis and Ryan are doing. Um, if you like this program and want to support programs like it at the ALF Museum and the Western Science Center, you can also find links on how to do that below. Uh, as always, make sure you like and subscribe for more stories from the world of paleontology. Thanks everybody so much, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thanks again.